Let's change gears for a second and talk about NAD, NR, okay. NMN, all these things. Um, I, I've had uh, David Sinclair on the podcast a couple of times. He's very eloquently explained what sirtuins are, how they work, why they require NAD. So for, for folks who want to get up to speed on that, um, you can do so in great depth. Do you want to give the 30 second answer as to why sirtuins matter and why they need NAD? Sure, but I would start by saying that I'm not sure that that sirtuins are the only or most important reason why NAD is important. Right? Sure, sure. So sir yeah. sirtuins are a class of NAD dependent, mostly deacetylases. They also can do some other um, activities, but but basically one way to think about it is that that sirtuins uh, take acetyl groups off of other proteins. Uh, that's their activity, and that that requires NAD, and it actually consumes NAD. So NAD is a cofactor for many metabolic reactions where it gets converted between NAD, which is the oxidized form of the coenzyme, and NADH, which is the reduced form. Uh, many, many different metabolic reactions use NAD in that way. Including so the electron NAD, transport chain. <laughs> including the electron transport right. chain, and glycolysis, right. and fermentation, yes. Um, sirtuins are fundamentally different in that they they use up NAD, right? Uh, um, uh, and so NAD is required for their activity. NADH, the reduced form of NAD, is actually an inhibitor of sirtuins. So the NAD to NADH ratio can be used as a proxy of, of likely sirtuin activity. Um, so sirtuins are, are important in the aging field. Um, you know, this really goes back to my work as a graduate student in yeast when I was a grad student with Lenny Garenti when we first showed that you could overexpress the yeast sirtuin, which is called SIR2, that's where sirtuin comes from. So the yeast protein is called SIR2. If you overexpress SIR2, you increase lifespan in yeast. And since then, other people have shown that, that activation or overexpression of sirtuins in worms or flies or mice can have interesting effects on aging. You and David must have overlapped, right? In the, you guys must have both been in Lenny's lab David at the same time. David and I overlapped in Lenny's lab. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So he was a postdoc when I was a grad student. And I got to give David, I mean, David and I have had our scientific disagreements over the years, um, but I got to give David a ton of credit. As, as a postdoc, you know, he uh, uh, mentored me um, in important ways and I think actually guided me to the project looking at SIR2, which is what I just talked about when we overexpressed SIR2. So, so David was a very important early um, influence on, on my scientific career. And, and the Garenti lab at that time, you know, was full of uh, really smart, I'm sure it's still full of really smart people, but it was just a really great environment. It was a powerhouse. Yeah, with, with lots, of, lots of really, um, really fantastic scientists. Um, so that was the first, and it was really Lenny's lab that established sirtuins as important in aging in, in multiple model systems. So in mice, um, I, I mean, I think, you know, David might disagree with this a little bit, but I think if you're being honest, right, the, the evidence that sirtuins are potent regulators of lifespan in mice is mixed. It's not strong. There are a couple of studies uh, out of probably, you know, a dozen that have been published, and there's probably two dozen that are unpublished where people saw no effects on lifespan from manipulator or activating sirtuins. There are a couple of studies that show, in one case, a, a brain-specific activation of one of the sirtuins called SIRT1 could slightly extend lifespan, and another that, that overexpression of a different sirtuin, SIRT6, could slightly extend lifespan, I think, only in males but nowhere near the, the reproducibility or magnitude of effect of other things, including rapamycin. So, so the, the data on sirtuins is broad, but, um, but the absolute effects on, on lifespan, at least, are, in my personal view, unconvincing. Like, it hasn't been broadly replicated like rapamycin has, and they're not big. What we do see with sirtuins is abundant evidence that, that metabolic markers of health can be improved by activating sirtuins. Um, and in a few other disease-specific models, pretty good evidence, heart disease in particular, some evidence for cognitive function as well, uh, uh, improvements in age-related outcomes. So there's a lot of smoke there, but I think, I think you know, <laughs> there's a lot of confusion in the field about the relative strength of data for different interventions. And at least in my view, you know, there's really no comparison between the effects you get from inhibiting mTOR and the effects, at least so far, that people have reported from 
from activating sirtuins. The mTOR is head and shoulders above sirtuins when it comes to magnitude of effect. Yeah, I, I, I think it would be impossible to dispute that. I, I don't think there could be any dispute of that. What's interesting is if I were to tally up the number of questions I get per month about NR and NMN versus Rapalogs, the, the, the ratio is the exact opposite to the magnitude. So if the effect size of rapamycin and the importance of mTOR is 10x that of yeah. <laughs> sirtuins, it's flipped in the number of questions I get um, about it. And, and just the, you know, the, the, the pop culture awareness of, of, of that. So let's put the, the marketing of that aside and talk about the chemistry <laughs> of it for a moment. Sure. So I think, um, right. So sirtuins are NAD dependent enzymes, right? So they need NAD to do their action. And we've already talked about in general, the model is that turning up sirtuins is, is, is a good thing, right? That you're going to get, if you're going to get benefits in the context of aging, that's going to happen from activating sirtuins. Again, that's a probably a pretty massive oversimplification because there are seven sirtuins, right? And they do different things and different things in different tissues, but that's kind of where the field has gotten stuck, right? The idea is that activating sirtuins is good. And so if you accept that and you and NAD is an activator of sirtuins, then more NAD is good. And there's, there's good evidence that NAD homeostasis becomes impaired with aging, that, that the ratio of NAD to NADH, the oxidized to reduced form of NAD, in many tissues at least, shifts towards more NADH and less NAD, right? And so that with age. And so the prediction would be that you would have declining sirtuin activity due to that metabolic shift. Um, and I will also note, because I think this is important, that in mitochondrial disease, you see the same shift. It's just much, much more pronounced. Mm. You see a shift towards NADH and less NAD. And that's exactly what you see when mitochondria are less functional because the cells will switch over to glycolysis and fermentation, right? Fermentation to lactate. And the whole reason why we ferment to lactate is to restore NAD levels, right? Fermentation to lactate takes NADH and turns it back into NAD. So it, this probably reflects an underlying metabolic defect, which could be mitochondrial in origin, that leads to this shift towards towards the reduced form of NAD with age. So, so those two observations, less NAD, right, bad, sirtuins good. The prediction is that, that if we could boost NAD, that would be good because that would then restore sirtuin activity and have effects on aging. And so this led to the, the development and popularization of, of these molecules called NAD precursors or NAD boosters. The two of which get talked about the most are, are nicotinamide riboside, NR, that was kind of the first to, uh, to gain popularity. And then nicotinamide mononucleotide, NMN. Both of those are precursors of NAD that within cells can be converted into NAD. And so, you know, there has, there's, a, there's a large body of literature uh, in a variety of model organisms showing that treatment with NR or NMN sometimes leads to benefits that are uh, associated with healthy aging. And in one study, uh, lifespan extension in mice. I say sometimes because there's also a large body of literature that, that doesn't reproduce those results. I including the ITP. Including the ITP, that's right. Which is, I think has to be considered the gold standard for at least mice data. I think that's true. Although, you know, as we talked about before, it's a different genetic background than, than C57 black six, right? And so I would the original argue it's a much better genetic background. I think, I think <laughs> well, I think you can make that argument and um, there are good reasons to, uh, to believe that argument. Mm -hmm. um, nonetheless, I, I, think, I, I think it's important to note, right? That that yeah. could be why it worked in one context and yeah, didn't work yes, in another absolutely. context. Um, and we've struggled with this as well in my lab. So, you know, it's been reported in this mitochondrial disease mouse by a collaborator of ours who I, I trust their data, right? That, that NMN could increase lifespan in that mouse model. We've tried multiple times with both NR and NMN in that mouse model and been unable to, to get these effects. So I think these drugs uh, are tricky uh, from, a, from a biological efficacy perspective to, there's something we don't understand about delivery or, or uptake uh, that. Do you think they're temperature stable? Probably. Well, I mean, I, I don't know. Um, I, I'm sure. I'm sure there are people who know the answer to that. 
Um, I've read conflicting things, right? I've read that, and I, I need to go back to the sources on it, but I've read that at least through the lens in which they're provided as supplements, the likelihood that by the time that thing arrives at your door, it still has the biologic activity that it would have had in a refrigerated manner is low. Now, I don't know that the companies yeah. that sell them recommend refrigerating them, but they might not recommend refrigerating them because then it would imply that they're being shipped in an unrefrigerated manner, which sort of nullifies the whole benefit. But right. Um, right. I don't know if, you, if, if you've looked at any of that. We haven't. Um, so I think so. Definitely, in our mouse studies, we are careful to keep the food in the in the refrigerator until we put it in the mouse cage. Um, I you know I, I suspect that, uh, that that there certainly is is might be some truth to the idea that the biological activity goes off over time at, at room temperature, um, but I think that reflects a bigger problem with the NAD precursor field, which is that you know, there's a lot of um, controversy even among the two camps. So, I mean, it's sort of funny, right? Because there's an NR camp of researchers who really, you know, think NR is the, the, the tool that we should use. And then there's an NMN camp and they both, you know, say that the other camp, that their molecule doesn't work, right? Because it's not biologically available or, you know, all sorts of reasons, right? So there's a lot of uh, lack of clarity around biological availability and efficacy with these molecules in the preclinical literature, right? Where, you know, in theory, people should be able to exactly reproduce the way that other people do the work and get the same results, right? There are lots of reasons why scientific results don't get replicated. It's my impression that in the NAD precursor field, that's a bigger problem than in some other areas. Um, and I don't know the reasons for that, but all I can say is we've experienced that in my lab as well. Um, so, so I, you know, I've tried to stay on the fence here because I think there's a ton of smoke, right? There's a ton of smoke with sirtuins. There's a ton of smoke with NAD precursors that they can, if you do the experiment the right way, have positive effects that look a lot like what we would expect for something that's impacting the aging process. And as I said, I mean, it's funny because, you know, people who are in the field, I think sometimes think of me as this anti-sirtuin guy, which is absolutely not the truth. I'm the guy, I'm the guy who first showed that you could overexpress a sirtuin and increase lifespan. If anybody's going to be pro-sirtuin, it's me. I think the problem is that I've seen a lot of data that has that people have struggled to reproduce, right? And and I and I just honestly don't know how to interpret that. Whereas with rapamycin, it works for everybody, right? It's robust and everybody gets the same result over and over and over again. So I'm less enthusiastic, I would say, about sirtuins and NAD precursors as, a, as opposed to some other interventions, right, in the, in the field. But I think there's a lot of data um, that suggests that, that these molecules and that sirtuins are important for aging. I think what, what we haven't done yet is figured out how to tweak the system in exactly the right way to get robust and reproducible experimental results that I personally would feel comfortable moving forward with clinically. And it might be that the answer is you have to hit this system with two prongs. You have to provide more of a precursor and you have to activate the sirtuin in the way that resveratrol attempted to do but wasn't doing. Right. So maybe right. the answer is it's both. Uh, again, I, that, that's that's literally yeah, right, just sure. that's a possibility. Yeah, I, yeah. The other thing that I find weird about the NAD precursor um, literature and the, the limited work that's been done clinically is often I mean, it, in principle, it should be trivial to determine whether or not you have boosted NAD levels. Right. If you treat somebody with an NAD precursor, we know how to measure NAD. That's not hard. Okay, so we know what the biomarker is, at least that far in this case. And oftentimes that's not done. So, so you know, if you're treating somebody with NR or NMN and you're not increasing NAD levels in the blood or in your target tissue, that should tell you something important, I would think. Well, and the other question is, is increasing it in the blood sufficient? That's a different question, but it is an important question. I yeah. agree. That's why I said target tissue. And we can't biopsy certain tissues, yeah. but we can biopsy some tissues. Yeah. No, the, 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 it's it's... It's super messy. Uh, look, I get asked about it at least once a week by patients and I usually yeah. point them to something I've written on the subject matter. But in the end I say, look, I will say, I think it's very safe. I really don't see right. a downside other than to your pocketbook of taking NR or NMN. Um, I think they're, so, so they, they check the first box of any intervention, which yeah. is, is the downside sufficiently low? And I think the answer is yes. I'm just having a hard time seeing upside. 
So yeah, and I'll tell you honestly, I, I would love to test NR or NMN or both in dogs for exactly that reason, right? Because that there is there is essentially no risk, um, and we could actually find out does it work? You know, three years from now, five years from now, I could tell you do NAD precursor slow aging at least in pet dogs. And I think if I saw if I saw NR slow aging increase lifespan and or improve multiple functional measures of aging in dogs. I'd be I'd be much more bullish on taking NR myself. Wouldn't prove it's going to work in people, but it yeah gets you gets you you know part part way there and a pretty big part of the way there. Um, and I would put that on the short list of things I would like to test. The the fact is nobody's going to do the definitive clinical trial in people because they don't have to because they can sell that stuff to people now, right? They don't they aren't required to do the clinical trial to show that it works. This podcast is for general informational purposes only and does not constitute the practice of medicine, nursing, or other professional healthcare services, including the giving of medical advice. No doctor-patient relationship is formed. The use of this information and the materials linked to this podcast is at the user's own risk. The content on this podcast is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Users should not disregard or delay in obtaining medical advice from any medical condition they have, and they should seek the assistance of their healthcare professionals for any such conditions. Finally, I take conflicts of interest very seriously. For all of my disclosures and the companies I invest in or advise, please visit peteratiamd.com forward slash about, where I keep an up-to-date and active list of such companies.